start with song 113 in your songbooks. How majestic is your name? 113.
What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Nittany yeah. Church. It's good Thank to you. see you all. Great to have you all here. Um, I wanted to dismiss, if you're part of Kids Kingdom, you're welcome to head on out. Becca will be, and Yushima will be doing Kids Kingdom, so you guys can follow them. All right, I'd love for us to turn together to Matthew chapter 19. I'd just love for us to read a passage together as we start the night. All right, we're going to be starting in verse 27 in Matthew chapter 19. And the Bible reads, Peter answered him, answered Jesus, we have left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses, or brothers, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or fields, for my sake, will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. And so I bring this up because uh, it's just been a thought of my heart. I feel like so often we, we feel like Peter, like, man, we've left everything to follow you, Jesus. Like, what's, what's going to be left for us? You know, maybe we ask that in a fear of losing something or we've just lost them something because of Jesus and it's just like, oh my gosh, what is in it for me? Like, what's gonna, like, is this worth it? Mm -hmm. yeah. Is the question. And I think here, Jesus encourages us. He says it will be worth it. You know, we don't have to fear losing things or giving up things or not being able to attain things that we feel like we need. Because he says everyone, whether it's you had to leave mother or father, whether it's you've left a field, which is maybe in our time and day like a job or some kind of career path or um, it's just one other thing, children feels, houses like comfort and, and just so many things we can think of. Jesus says if you, you will be okay. That's if you right. lose those things for my sake. So I just wanted to share this for any of you who are struggling with losing something right now or that fear of holding on to something. I just want to say, you'll be okay. And so with that, let's pray and we'll continue our night together. Mm -hmm. <sighs> Lord God, I'm just so grateful um, for this night together that we can all be with you. I'm grateful that we can be content in you, that you are worth it in and of yourself. You are so amazing and awesome and just I'm so grateful that I can have you, that I'm sure we're grateful that we can have you as well. I pray for this night, I pray for the lesson that it can be edifying to your people, that you can be with Rob and Cindy as they teach and preach, um, that you can put the words on their mouths um, and that you can be with them. I pray for the worship, Pray for the communion, God, and for the fellowship. It's your son's name, I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. I'm going to invite the worship team back up to sing a few more songs. We got it, Rob. All right, everybody, may stand. The next song I'm going to be singing is 383. When I survey, well, it's 382, actually. That's right. Typos happen, guys. For grace is here. <laughs> 382 when I survey the wondrous cross. <clears throat> when I survey the Cheers. 
everybody. If you don't know me, my name is Emma. Um, but I first just wanted to say thank you all for inviting me into your church. I just can think of everybody here, just something that they've done for me that I felt very loved and cared for. So I just wanted to first start off saying thank you for that. Um, but if you would please turn with me to 2 Corinthians 4. All right. We're going to start off in verse 10. And it reads, We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. So then death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. Um, so I've recently been reminded of like the cross in my life. I know it's like, oh, you shouldn't be forgetting about that, but I think it's very easy to mm -hmm. go about my daily life and just be like, wow, like, I forgot like Jesus died for me. Um, and it's really refreshed my purpose and my drive for my faith. Um, and to be reminded, like looking at the scriptures, like in Matthew 26 and going through all that, like my friend, Jesus, my, like my friend, he died for me. He, this, this man that I talk about to others, the, this man that I read about in scripture, this man that I talk to, um, I can very easily forget that um, he took up my suffering, he bore my sins on the cross in my place. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I'm alone in this. Nope. Um, I think it's very easy for us to forget the reason that we get to come to God in the first place because Jesus divided that wall. Um, so like during school or work, we're at home with our friends and family. Um, it's very easy to forget um, that we get to experience God's love because of Jesus. Um, and forget that he's forgiven us of our past sins, our, what we're sinning from now and what we're going to sin from. Um, and I heard a friend say this to me the other day, um, and it, she said, if you were the last person on earth, Jesus would still have to die for you in order for you to be saved. Um, that's really hard to hear and to really let that sink in, but I'm just gonna read that again. Um, and just imagine you in that place, just think, if you were the last person on earth, Jesus would still have to die for you in order for you to be saved. And I appreciate this scripture because I think it's very important to remember the whole reason that we get to have faith in the first place is, for, is because of Jesus dying on the cross. Um, and now, you don't have to turn there, but I'm just going to read from 1 Peter 2. Um, and really take to heart, even close your eyes if you want um, to really listen to um, what is being said here. And it says, To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you are like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the, to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. And I'm going to pray for communion. Pray. Lord, thank you, God, that we get to come together in your name here. Um, please let us not forget um, the whole reason that we can come to you in the first place, because Jesus, you divided that wall for us. Um, you took up our sin, all of our sin here, and that we get to take your your flesh and your blood and that we can be reminded of how you have forgiven us and that we can come to you, Lord. Um, please bless this church service in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And that concludes our communion portion of the service today. Amen. Rob and I are going to do the the sermon, the lesson, the preaching, however you want to name it. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, and I'm just going to start us off here. And um, we're continuing our study on the book of Revelation here. And we are finally rounding off our letters to the churches. There were seven of them. Probably felt like a long seven weeks maybe to you. Or maybe you learned a lot, and that would be great. Um, you know, but our biggest theme here is just that Jesus is the answer. Mm -hmm. And it seems trite. I mean, I don't want to say that, but I, I think sometimes in our lives, there comes a point where we feel like that's kind of trite. <laughs> it's just a simple answer. It's very pat.
But you know, I'm hoping that through even the letter to Doubt Loud to See that you might be able to see that you know Jesus really is the answer. He really does provide everything that we need to be able to live a happy spiritual life that is full of you know just goodness and is life-giving and beneficial to everybody around us. Amen. Um, and ultimately leads us to spend the eternity with our Creator. So first, you know. I, I like to do the thing where I bring cultural context into the scriptures, right, and help you to see, like, you know, that has a role. You know, we don't just read scripture in a vacuum. We have to try to understand our authors, you know, and what mm -hmm. they're writing, how, how they, you know, how the audience would interpret what they're saying, you know, and it helps us to be able to apply that in our lives today. Mm -hmm. um, so first of all, I just want to talk about location. Um, you can see the yellow, that would be our city of focus today, La Vizia. As you can see, it's pretty close to Heropolis to the north and Colossae to the south. Now, interestingly enough, we did a study on the Book of Colossians, like, you know, probably a while ago at this point. Um, but, so the letter to the Colossians actually mentions Laodicea. So it's like this family of three, you know, of three cities and three churches. And so they have letters that circulated around them. Um, and so Laodicea was mentioned in the Book of Colossians. So this isn't the first time we're hearing about this. Mm -hmm. um, now, Heropolis to the north is actually known for its mineral hot springs. It was really great, like, you know, if you're a soldier and you were looking for some R&R, &R, that's where you went to get some healing. You know, if you were a wealthy senator and wanted to, you know, sit in a hot spring, that's where you would go. Um, and then to the south, Colossae was known for its red wool. I didn't put that up there. But it's also known for a natural freshwater spring. So you have hot water to the north and cold water to the south. And Laodicea, unfortunately, because of its location, only got lukewarm water. So this is important for later. Wow. <laughs> um, so some other things that Laodicea is known for is that it was, it was founded on a major trade route. And um, so they had a lot of merchants coming through. But they also had a lot of things to get. They had their own industry. And their textile industry was really big at the time. It's actually in that... Uh, Arena, um, I'm sorry, I was like looking for the map, but it's not there anymore. Um, but in that area, it's still known for its textile industry. Um, and it's famous for its black wool. And there was also a tunic called the Tremata. And it was really famous across the Roman Empire. Um, Laodicea also had a medical school. And uh, they had a temple to Asclepius. If you remember last time I was up here, I talked about, you know, kind of the temple and the ritual you had to go through. But this is where, you know, all of the, the Greeks went to learn about medicine. And so they had a major medical school there as well. And one of the alumni um, was specialized in ophthalmology. And he invented his own eye salve called the Phrygian powder, because Phrygia is kind of the name of that region of the, of the three cities. And it was a, a special treatment for the eyes, and people loved to come to Laodicea to get it. Um, also, that area was prone to major earthquakes, and um, in 60 AD or CE, um, there was a major earthquake. And usually, how the, you know, the Roman Empire would come and repair the cities that were especially important for Rome's stability. Um, this was one of the cities that Rome offered aid to. But Laodicea said, no, thank you. We have a lot of wealth, and we can do it ourselves. Um, and it wasn't an insult. They were just kind of like, hey, we want to take this on ourselves. And they did. Uh, they had their own mint, so they minted their own coins. Um, there is a rumor or a story that one of their coins that they printed, we did it ourselves to commemorate that point when they had the earthquake and they rebuilt their city. Um, I haven't actually found it, <laughs> so I don't know. It's definitely just a story, um, but it kind of speaks to the attitude that the people in Laodicea had. You know, they were the pull ourselves up by our bootstraps kind of people. You know, uh, they really depended and looked towards their wealth, and they felt like everything is fine, everything is great. So, with that in mind, we are going to read our scripture. I'm just going to take the first half, and Rob is going to take the second half here. So here we go. <clears throat> Starting in verse 14 of Revelation chapter 3, it reads, To the angel of the church in Laodicea, write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, 
the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, so you can become rich, and white clothes to wear, so you can cover your shameful nakedness, and salve to put on your eyes, so you can see. So, having gone over what Laodicea has famous for, and then reading the scripture, does it kind of come alive a little bit mm -hmm. more for you? Yeah. Do you start to see, like, huh, <laughs> Jesus, or John, knew what he was talking about, knew what he was trying to address with these people. And that's what I love about history. So just a plug for that. Whenever you read your Bible, try and look up some history. It's so helpful. Mm -hmm. So the first thing, you know, and Jameson went over this rubric and, and uh, Lucas went over this rubric as well, is that each of these letters had a kind of, you know, uh, a checklist of things that we would see every time. So if you feel like it's repetitious, it kind of, it a little bit is because they're going through like a formulaic way of how they're writing. So there's an introduction, you know, to Jesus and who he is and who he's trying to establish himself to be for this church. There's a commendation, deeds that they're doing. There's a, you know, kind of a, a rebuke, things that they're not doing right. Um, may, and uh, maybe something that they're, you know, it's not so bad. And then at the end, like a consequence and an encouragement, right? Um, Laodicea, funny enough, is one of those guys that didn't have a commendation. But, you know, we, we see that Jesus does introduce himself and I think that how he introduces himself here is also very telling. He calls himself, um, these are the words of the amen. He calls himself the amen. Now, usually, like at the end, we are used to saying amen at the end of a prayer. And we usually understand it to mean like, let it be true or, or so be it or something along those lines. When you have it proceeding in the beginning of, you know, a passage or a letter or something like this, it is to like communicate trust and confidence in the source. Mm. That the truth, you're getting the truth. No matter, you're not getting anything else, just the truth. And so Jesus stands as like truth itself before this church. He calls himself the faithful witness. Um, I refer, the, one of the cross references, I have a Bible that has cross references in the middle, and so sometimes that's a way to like just kind of look for other verses that either use the same wording or has the same meaning. Um, and this one reference back to John 18, 37, which is actually like Jesus is before Pilate. And he's saying, I'm the faithful witness to God. I'm God here on earth, you know, and I'm showing you who he is by my life, by what I do. Um, it, he also calls himself the ruler of God's creation. And this refers back to Proverbs 8.22. And this is actually wisdom speech in the beginning. This is like, wisdom is like, I was there before the world started. You know, before the world was even created, I was there. You know, and uh, so just saying like, Jesus was also there before the creation of the world. That makes him the ruler too. He saw it happen. And then Jesus goes on to talk about the problem and the lack of a commendation here. He says, you're not, neither hot nor cold. He says it a few times, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and so when you have repetition, pay attention, you know? Um, but we see from the geography, yeah, they're neither hot nor cold. And so it is also with the people themselves. Now, it's been said before that you want to be hot for God. You want to be fired up for God, you know, and yeah, that's true. But cold water also has some useful benefits to it, right? Do you want hot water on a hot day? No. Does anybody want that? <laughs> no, you want some cold water. You want something refreshing. 
um, you know, and the hot water has healing properties. I mean, it feels nice on a winter day, you know, to have a warm cup of coffee or cocoa in your hands, mm -hmm. you know, to sit in a hot tub. That's one of my favorite things. Something that just melts away your stress, you know, relaxes your muscles, you know, and then you have the health benefits of mineral water. Like, you're just golden, you know, but they both have good properties. They both have good things. So it's not about one is better than the other, but it's the utility. It's the usefulness of the water. And what he's saying here is that the people have become useless. They now have blended in to the culture around them. Yep. They have taken on what was happening. They have taken on the dependence on wealth. They've taken on like clothing themselves in, you know, these rich, cloths, you know, they've taken on and put their security in the mint and in their banking system. They've put their security in the eye salve or the medical school that they mm -hmm. have there. They have all the major things that you could ever need. Think of what you really need in your life right now. You know, I need money for rent. I need food on the table. I need clothing. And God knows we need them all. But we have to ask ourselves, what are we doing to get there? How are we using these things. How are we, are we being useful to the people around us? So, and so because of this, Jesus was about to vomit them out. You know, it says spit out, but it's kind of more forceful than that. And, you know, this term has been used in, in the Old Testament as well. Um, I have Leviticus 18, 24 to 28, or chapter 20 to 22. What they're both saying is that God lays out laws not to make life difficult, but to make life better. Mm -hmm. But the consequences of not obeying God's laws would be, in the Old Testament, it said the land will vomit you out, <laughs> um, which it actually did eventually. Um, they were cast out of their land that God had promised them because of years and centuries of disobedience and polluting the land with their sin, with the things that they were doing to themselves and each other. So Jesus makes an offer to them. Sometimes we're not aware of how we're really doing. Mm -hmm. When life is good, when you have everything you need, you get comfortable mm -hmm. and you forget some things. Mm -hmm. Oh, I can miss prayer time. I can miss church. I can miss time with my friend and sister or brother who's trying to help me with my life. Um, you know, we get, we can get complacent when, when life is too good. You know, there is, <laughs> can be such a thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, their dependence on wealth had caused them to compromise <coughs> God's ethics to get what they thought that they needed. So here reference is uh, Hosea 12, six to eight, and we had just done this exercise on Wednesday where we tried to like look up some Old Testament scriptures with Revelation. And I know Spencer pointed this out, but what was interesting is that like, if you read the whole chapter, it talks about what God is really upset about because it's not wealth, it's not money. You know, Abraham had a lot of wealth. Job had a lot of wealth and was very faithful to God, you know? Um, so it's not the money. It's not that rich people are bad, you know, but it is about how did you get it? And one of the biggest complaints in Hosea in chapter 12 is that there was a lot of violence. There was a lot of defrauding. People were using dishonest scales. They were not maintaining justice and they were not spreading God's love. You know, there's more important things to God than just, you know, money. <laughs> or like that rich people are, are bad or anything like that. It's about, are you being just? Are you being loving? So, he's tr so Jesus is offering, get your needs met through me. I can help you. I can give you everything that you need. Buy from me gold refined in the fire. Proverbs 17, three talks about, you know, the like the crucible for silver, the furnace for gold, you know, but God tests the heart. It's not testing like he wants to get you. It's testing because he wants to prove what you're made of, right? And sometimes in times of suffering and hard trials, you get to see what you're really made of. Right. 
And that's what God and, and Jesus want to do for you. Yeah. You know, buy gold for me. Your faith. How does your faith do when it's being tested? When it's being proved? White clothes to cover shameful nakedness. Now, it's not to contrast from the black wool or anything like that. It's just, they're like, we're going to close ourselves. We, we can take care of that. We can clothe our own nakedness and shame. But what are they covering? So I go back to Genesis 3, because this is what I, what I think of. Adam and Eve covered their nakedness. When they discovered they were naked, they tried to sew fig leaves together and cover themselves. But at the end of the chapter, God made clothes for them. He provided for them. Zechariah 3, 1 to 4, is an Old Testament prophet that's also very apocalyptic in nature, has a some of the same literary images that we would see in, in Revelation. But it talks about a priest who was clothed, whose clothes were dirty, you know, and then an angel, God directs an angel to come and change out those clothes and put new ones. It was the removal of sin. It was the removal of shame. And it's the only thing we could get from God. And we can only get that from God. We can't do it for ourselves. Mm -hmm. We try to cover our shame. We try to like not be exposed for who we are. But you know, we try to do it in ways that are ineffective. You know, but only God can provide for you the ways to move through your shame. You know, to have honor. You know, in your life, mm -hmm. to not fear ex exposure. Mm -hmm. You know, God can do that for you. And I saw many of Jesus' miracles involved healing, blindness. And he usually contrasted with somebody else's spiritual blindness, like the Pharisees, things like that. And it's really about repentance. It's really about like having a different view of your life, having a different view of everything around you. We are bombarded by worldly realities, you know, and, and wars and, and mm. things like that, and how people treat each other. But God is always in control. Do you feel that? Or do you try to get control yourself? You know, are you missing the way that God is working in, the, in your life and the lives of the people around you? You know, it's, it's learning to see things through God's view, not just our own limited view. Oh, so that would be, <laughs> that would be you. Sorry about that. Um, but these are just things to think about, you know, and, and what Jesus can do for you, what God can do for you. It's not small. You know, these are amazing things that, that Jesus can help us with in our life on a daily basis. And Amen. so I'm going to have Rob come up now. All right. Right. Amen. Do you feel blessed by getting to hear from Cindy? Yes. yes. I think you should. Yeah, I think you really should. She's a teacher. <laughs> Sounds great. Um, so uh, we're going to continue on a little bit. Um, so I've got the second half. Um, I'm going to read here in a sec. But um, so as Cindy pointed out, there was no commendation for Laodicea. You get to Laodicea, and this is kind of like probably, I don't know, one of the... I feel like it's the most famous of the, the letters to the church. It's one way you can go and see a lot. Yeah. You pull out yeah. the not cold deal. You pull out yes. the, not, the door knocking deal. That's right. But a lot of see it gets no yeah, like gold should. star for anything. So you're like, wah, wah. You know, so you can kind of read that one and be a little bit like, oh, I really wouldn't want to be them, you know? Um, but I want to reframe that a little bit for us, right? They don't, they don't get accommodation of like, this is going well. They, they definitely don't get that. Um, they're the only one of the seven that didn't get that. But what they are getting is a lot of love and grace. Mm -hmm. I think when you read the second half here and you kind of see what Jesus is offering them, right? And Cindy, you know, in, in, in her chunk mentions basically Jesus' first offer of, hey, gold refined in fire, sapphire eyes, white clothes, right? That's kind of their first offer. Uh, but let's read a little further because they've got, right. they've got a big opportunity if they are willing to accept it. Continuing in uh, Revelation 3, 19. Uh, Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, 
just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So there's, if you look for it, there's like two more offers that Jesus gives them to fix their problem. Mm -hmm. I mean, they've got a big problem. <laughs> um, and we kind of can wonder, like, did they make it? You know, did they, did they repent? I don't, I don't really know. Uh, we do know, like, in 4th century, I think like 83, 63, there was a council of Laodicea, right? So they were, they were a big deal. Whether they were doing well in the eyes of Jesus at that point, I'm not sure. I haven't been able to find an answer to that, but they were prominent uh, one way or another. So they stuck around a while. So they didn't get, you know, their lampstand removed necessarily, like they just got erased. Um, they were around, um, but they had three different pathways. So hopefully they took, you know, some or, or all of these offers from, from Jesus and kind of got this sorted out. Uh, we talked about the first offer, and there's two more offers of challenges from Jesus disciplining Laodicea out of tremendous love for them. Now, we should just kind of camp a little bit on verse 19, and there's all kinds of references you can probably think of, you know, maybe beyond what I've got listed here. Deuteronomy 8, 5, Proverbs 3, 12, 1 Corinthians 11, 32, Hebrews 12, 5, 6, all basically saying, that, like, God is rebuking and disciplining those that he loves. It's not like this is punishment and you're bad, you know what I mean? And it's, I see the potential in you and I, I know that you can do this. I'm giving you opportunities. I'm trying to help you. Um, we can look at a couple of those. Um, let's see here. Just want to make sure that we're kind of framing it this way. This is very helpful, I think. So Deuteronomy 8, 5. Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, so the Lord your God disciplines you. Proverbs 3, 12. Because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father, the son he delights in. 1 Corinthians 11.32, when we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned with the world. And then Hebrews 12, probably most familiar with, and you have forgotten that the word, the word of encouragement that addresses you as sons. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines those he loves. He punishes everyone he accepts as a son. So, they should kind of be like encouraged that Jesus is speaking up on this. He could have just been like, yeah, we're doing the spitting out part and you're done. <laughs> like, I'm just done. He could have done that. This is not Jesus' style. He's like, I, I'm right here. I'm ready to help you out with this if you're willing to see your need and repent. So repentance and restoration. Um, it's really, you know, totally great. This whole idea that Jesus is standing at the door like, I'm, I'm right here. I'm standing at the door. I'm, knock, I'm knocking on your door. Right? I'm, I'm making myself available. It's really great that Jesus provides that opportunity to do that at all. Um, and, you know, we, we kind of we know this about this, this passage, but uh, it's worth pointing out. This is a letter written to a church mm -hmm. containing Christians. That's right. <laughs> Plural and saved already, right? Mm -hmm. um, this passage is often used as like, hey, this is how you become a Christian. That doesn't make any sense if it's written to people who are Christians already. Not only that, it's probably more corporate and collective than it is individual. Mm -hmm. You know, the idea of like, Jesus is going to come into you, it's not into you, it's in, to you, like toward you, into, you know, the, the church. Mm -hmm. You know, this is basically like, hey guys, I would come back in and fellowship with you if you would just kind of accept that and weren't so self-reliant, thinking that you had it all together, because mm -hmm. Sam is telling them they don't. Um, but there's this tension between God's grace and our responsibility, right? This is kind of cool, um, where it's not like Jesus is just going to come in and go, like, don't worry about it, it's good, like, I got this, like, you're just fixed. They had, it up, they had a responsibility to see their need and respond to it. Like, this is the same kind of way for us. And kind of what I want to, what I think is helpful to look at this letter at, as is kind of as a parallel to the prodigal son story, um, which is really kind of what's going on. You could... You know, could look at it as maybe a prodigal church. You know, I kind of seen that idea and thought that that really fit very well. That there's there's a strong parallel between what Jesus is offering him and what the father of the prodigal son offered, right? Um, but the son had to go take his own steps on his way home. So the father didn't chase him down. He's like, I'm I'm available, okay, but you're going to have to take your own steps, you know, in my direction as well. 
Um, and Jesus doesn't force this. This is kind of the other cool thing, you know, when I stand at the door and knock, that I think that image, you know, might be a callback to a lot that the Romans had where Roman soldiers could just kind of come up to your house and be like, duff, duff, duff. I'm cold, I'm tired, I'm hungry, stay at your house, give it up. <laughs> and you just had to do that, you know. Um, Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus doesn't force himself on us like, I'm, I'm making an opportunity, you have to accept it. Um, he's, you know, polite in that way. Um, but what's on the other side of that, you know, that Jesus is on the other side of that door. He's like, you could knock and open that, and I'm right here. Like, I'm ready. It's not like you got to go across this chasm, or I'm going to come and, you know, beat you up for why you're such a knucklehead, you know, and got yourself into this jam. But I'm here. I want to come in with you and sit with you, eat with you. You eat with me. We have close fellowship again. We're good. You know, just like, you know, the prodigal son's father he didn't go like, you know, you, you knucklehead, you took my money, you went and you got the pig pens and the prostitutes and all that, and what's wrong with you? They didn't get any of that. You just killed a fatted calf, put a ring on his finger, celebrate. My son who was lost is found, right? It's the same opportunity Jesus is offering Laodicea, which is pretty cool. Um, yeah. I think, I mean, there's a song we're going to sing when we're done with this, and I really want this stuff to kind of sink in. Because, I mean, it's easy to read this letter and, and feel eh, it's discouraged, you know what I mean? But... Consider yourself as Laodicea. I mean, it's kind of probably worth noting, Laodicea among the seven churches is probably the one that like we in Western culture probably need to put on like the most. I mean, most people that analyze Revelation, they're like, you know, this church is for them, this church is for them. Well, the Western world, like, yeah, that's Laodicea. You know, like, so this is kind of the one we need to go, you know, try that on, even though that's very uncomfortable. Um, but personally too, you know, I think the cool thing in here is seeing how Jesus pursues us. Like, he's like, I'm not done with you. Like. Yeah, you messed, you're not doing well, like, you know, but it's not like you're done. Like, I'm right here if you just acknowledge your need and turn around. Um, I thought that was kind of cute. I mean, I'll come over so you can overcome. So this is kind of the, the end part. Um, you know, basically, like, you know, Jesus is going to come there, but they have to take some steps. He's inviting them to overcome, which is the third of the three offers. Um, kind of in the end, it says, like, to him overcomes, I'll give the right to sit with me on my throne. That, that's kind of cool. Like, I don't know, you get to sit in dad's chair. Like, you know, I remember when I was a kid, like, go, I go fly and, I mean, pre 9-11, if kids go to the cockpit of an airliner, they let you go sit up there at the control, yeah. you're never doing that again. But you felt really awesome when you did that. You didn't, I mean, Henry knows what I'm talking about. Um, but, you know, like, you get to sit with me, you know, on, on the throne, like, I get to do that? I mean, did you not just Thanks. remember, like, how bad we're doing here and how you're gonna spit us out? But, like, if we turn this around, like, we get to share in your victory and, and the spoils, like that, that's awesome. Um, that, that's what he's offering them, mm -hmm. but they still need to return, you know, to actively, you know, resisting the pull of the world. This is the overcoming piece, you know, and Cindy's talked about it a lot. In the same way, you know, the, the Laodicean disciples became lukewarm because they just kind of blended in with the culture. There's like no contrast. You just can't, ten, can't tell them apart from the world around them. You know, I mean, they're enjoying all the same stuff. And they're doing the same things. They're steeped in the culture. They're steeped in the, you know, empirical, you know, cult of worship there, basically, in one way or another. Uh, they had to resist that. They had to go like, you know what? Uh, Jesus is my culture. You know, identify as a Christian. You know, that's like what I need to go do. I don't need to go worry about blending in. I need to worry about standing out. Mm -hmm. And standing out in a useful way where I'm offering healing and refreshment, mm -hmm. right? Um, Jesus was always willing to offer that grace, but you know these guys had been unwilling to receive it because they're like, we're good. I, I was in the exact same spot, you know, when I was. This scripture was used on me when I was saying the Bible, not because of the door knocking thing, but because you're poor, blind, pitiful, and wretched, and that was me, because I was just seeing like, oh, I've got this. I've got you know all the things that the world tells me I should acquire. I'm good. I'm like, I don't really see my need for God. You know what I mean? And and that can, I think, be a, a continual struggle, maybe for you as well. You know, uh, in addition to me, but. Where I think, especially in the culture we live in, it's kind of easy to just say like, well, I get this, I get that, I get that, I get that all together, and then I don't really need God anymore. You know, kind of like just design your way out of needing God. Some way, somehow, on some level, I think we all sort of kind of do that and don't want to go really viscerally need to rely on God day in and day out, moment to moment, you know, to live. We're like, you're literally not getting by if God isn't pulling you through. That's a a challenging place to be, but that's what he's calling them mm -hmm. back to. But they were like, we don't need a thing. Um, let's flip over to John 16 real quick. It's worth you know, this one you're familiar with, but I'll just get that in front of our eyeballs as well. 
because this is important. Like, I think where, you know, Jesus is saying, hey, you know what, I've, I've done this. <laughs> like, you don't have to actually go fight all the battles and win them necessarily. So I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Amen. And it's kind of a cool thing. that yeah. it's, it's not like, you know, Jesus has, gone, has already gone and gained all the ground. He's gained the high ground. You know, <laughs> we just kind of need to go stand in it and kind of consolidate his, his wins. I know somebody's thinking about Anakin over there. <laughs> it was fancy. If Joseph were here, he'd be quoting that. Um, but yeah, you know, we were kind of already, you know, gained all those victories. You know, Jesus has already got that. We just got to kind of just say like, okay, I, I trust that you won this. I, I will stand with you in this gained territory that you've, that you've gained in the world. Um, but we need to kind of hold it too. You know, I mean, there's, there needs to be an ongoing resistance to the world, right? Mm -hmm. This yeah. is kind of, this is kind of the big thing. And that's kind of where I'll, I'll start to kind of wrap this a bit. Um, that's going to be kind of a wrapper for the whole stack of seven churches, I think. Um, really is like, are you going to compromise? Mm -hmm. Or are you going to remain faithful and overcome? That, that's really what those seven letters really, I think, mostly mm -hmm. boil down to. Are you going to yeah. compromise and blend in with the world in some kind of way, give in to what's going on around you, and just do the things that you see, rather doing what God's calling you to? You know, and, and risk being, you know, uncomfortably different, but hopefully usefully different. Uh, but Laodicea, for one, um, for there, I think this is kind of more or less where it boils down to recapping uh, the front half. You know, rather than blending in the world around you, stand out and provide useful contrast. You know, whether it's refreshing the weary or healing the broken, uh, recognize your need for Jesus. Like, you're just going to have to do this. And this is not just like a when you become a Christian kind of a thing. This is a daily kind of thing. They need to recommit to a saving faith. You know, faith is ref refined by trials, hardships. Mm -hmm. Recommit to holiness. I mean, I think that's kind of what the white cloth deal is about. That's kind of what that represented. Mm -hmm. And they were interested, and this, this can be the same thing for us, where it's like, I want to be a Christian. I want to go to church. I want to feel good about myself. I want people to look, think highly of me. But I'm not terribly interested in living a life of holiness. You know what I mean? Where it's like, I'm going to be, you know, set apart. I mean, that's really all the holiness really means is being set apart for God's purpose, you know, apart from the world. And we're willing to do that. Um, and then having our vision restored by Jesus. I mean, we kind of think we know what right and wrong looks like in the eyes of the world. You see this happen all the time on social media. Somebody's got some standard of righteousness that they decided all on themselves. And God help you if you do not agree. Mm -hmm. They will condemn you. And then tomorrow it'll be different. And they'll condemn you some more. And that person, like, it's just ridiculous the way we kind of chase that stuff. Yeah. But it all goes back to the garden of, I'm going to define right and wrong on my terms. And I'm not going to listen to the standard that God gave to me. And God is saying, like, you need to come back to that. You need to re return to, like, a first commandment kind of discipleship and a faithfulness to my commands. Mm -hmm. Eyes to see spiritual realities. Because that, that's kind of like, well, okay, once I kind of seen the world through God's eyes, and that's another way to talk about repentance, right? I'm just not going to see the world the way I define it anymore, but I'm going to see the world the way God does, change my worldview. That's where I want to be. Quickly accepting opportunities to repent. Uh, we could look at other, there's other kind of door, you know, scriptures to kind of look at. Um, but mostly it's like, you know, the, the bridegroom one comes to mind. Like they will quickly answer the door and let the bridegroom in. We need to kind of quickly answer that knock when Jesus is like, you have an opportunity to repent here and take it. I advise you take it. Um, and then lastly, really standing in Jesus' victory over the world we talked about. I think, you know, realizing like, yeah, there's hard work to do, but most of it's already done. We just kind of need to like, claim what Jesus has already gained victory over. Um, so that's pretty much all we have uh, for today, but I just want to encourage you as we're looking back through the seven churches, really ask yourself, like, am I really willing to commit the first commandment discipleship to Jesus? Am I compromising? In what ways? I mean, there's ways. I mean, dig deep and look into areas of your life. There's ways that we all compromise and just blend in with some aspect of the world, the culture, the music, the movies, the language, the whatever, medicine, maybe it's just like we didn't even get into all the different ways of, you know, really the Greek influence on the world we did, like our kind of worship of like Penn State football. Like those are all the same things that are the same stuff that they went through. I went a little bit too far. I went a little too far. I can't do that here. Like, oh, this is the thing. We're like, but that's the culture. You can't say that, right? That's, those are the kinds of pressures that we feel, right? But I mean, like when you 
When you go to a Penn State football game, oh, you're, you feel like you're going to church. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> right. There's the, fa- there's the faithful right there. There's the faithful. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. You know what I mean? Like that. But it was the same exact kind of stuff that the Roman Empire did. Like, if we keep the people entertained, we're paying attention to what we're doing. That's right. That's a whole other sign. Yeah. Um, but anyways, ask yourself in those uncomfortable ways, like, what ways am I just kowtowing to the culture around me and just kind of putting Jesus on the back burner? Because yeah, that's, that's what he's calling about. Good stuff. Amen. Let's pray. Amen. All right. Uh, dear God, we are grateful and convicted, God, by uh, the letters to the churches. It, it can be easy to go, it's written to people, you know, a couple thousand years ago, it's not me, uh, but it's us. Um, mm-hmm. A lot of in particular it can be us, God. It could be corporately, it could be individually, God. Help us to listen to what the Spirit says to the churches, God, um, and realize that those lessons are renewable uh, today and um, for each of us, God. And help us try those things on of all the churches and all the challenges that they went through, God, and the ways that they were both, you know, commended or condemned or challenged, but encouraged, God, and offered plenty of opportunities for grace and repentance and forgiveness and restoration to close fellowship with you. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. 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 So in light of all that, we would like you to stand and sing with us a song called Reckless Love, which I think is, I don't know, I was prepping for this, uh, that's, that came to mind for sure. Okay. It was like the way that God just pursues us for love. If you don't know the lyrics, you can pull them up on your, oh wait, no, we got them up here. Right there. Oh, snazzy. <laughs>
a seat. Let's get some announcements going. That's right, we're gonna close out with some announcements. Beautiful. We love announcements. Yes, it's we our do. favorite. You know thing. where we're going. <laughs> I just want to say thanks so much, Robin, Cindy. That message yeah. was awesome. You're so much good really stuff. Um, well yeah, yeah, yeah. I appreciate just like that reminder to be set apart and stand out because it's it's hard. <laughs> I think so often we don't want to, <laughs> but to like be that light for Jesus, be that um, example for Him in the life of one where you follow Him is, is an important thing for us to do. Yep. Um, so just again some announcements. Uh, for Wednesday, Wednesday at 7 is going to be family groups. So keep an eye out on your group meet. If you're not a part of a family group and would like to be one, um, please talk to either myself or Rob or Cindy, and we can get you connected to one. Um, and this Friday, we're going to have a pretty exciting fall fest. Whole church, oh, fall yes. fest. Lots of little activities, games, food, time to hang out and just have a lot of fun. And so keep that on your radar. Everybody's invited. It'll be 7 o'clock at the Crankles house. They've oh, been gracious yeah. enough to open up to house. us. What's that? Definitely be a fire. Oh, yes. Oh, be a very, very large bonfire. bonfire. <laughs> um, you may get shot in the eye by a Nerf gun. Um, Wear glasses. I'll, I'll email the address <coughs> to Guy Junior or whatever that hospital is called. Um, next Sunday, we are having our Friendsgiving churchwide potluck. Yeah. So keep an eye on your email box. Uh, Frank sent out a list um, yes, earlier did. about something you can He's sign up to turkey. give. But well, mine's going to be fried. <laughs> <laughs> so definitely bring something out. It's just going to be a big, big Friendsgiving, big time for us to eat together and be in the spirit of Thanksgiving before the students all leave um, for, for home. So keeping it right on that, and an announcement for the campus ministry, the um, Pittsburgh AO group will be visiting us um, this weekend. Okay. So they'll be with us Friday as well at the Fall Fest too, and around on Saturday as well. So just to be aware of that. And if you'd like to give contribution um, to our church, you can find that on the Tithely app. If you have any questions about how to go about doing that, feel free to talk to me. But um, that's everything. Oh wait, sorry, no. Josh also has an announcement. Yes. I'm about so, something as well. Yeah. So, hey guys. Uh, so, I partner up with the Center County Youth Service Bureau mm. of Center County. And just the other day, Dean Bishop approached me uh, to ask for you guys' help. Uh, November is National Runaway Prevention Month. So, there's a lot of youth that like run away or they're homeless. Mm. Uh, so basically, uh, Lucas is going to send an email with the information about it, but on the 16th, uh, the way we can help is by wearing green and just hashtagging the thing that he's going to send out to your Instagram and uh, social media. And when you do that, you're actually putting yourself into a raffle to get some merchandise from the youth service bureau, but I'm not sure exactly what it is, but besides that, it's actually helping with spreading the word about one-way prevention. Mm -hmm. So if you guys can do that for me, that'd be great. And Lucas is gonna send out the flyer, the email with the flyer. Great. So, thank you. Thanks, Josh. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. So again, like Josh was saying, just keep an eye on your email box and you'll get the information for the um, runaway awareness information, so. Thanks again, Josh, for sharing that. That's all of our announcements. So you guys are all dismissed. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Nice.